Today's scripture reading is from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, where the Apostle Paul writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The word of the Lord. I think Bob's going to come up and pray for our children. So we are in week 12 of our study of uh, 2 Timothy. Only one more week to go, and then we will be, Lord willing, in 1 Timothy. Now, I know that seems kind of odd. I'll explain that more when we get to 1 Timothy, but that's okay. And uh, think of it kind of like moonwalking with the Lord there. If you don't know what that is, I, you know, find an older person. They'll explain it to you. Um, but as we look at this and look at that uh, Second Timothy is about discipling. In other words, helping people, loving God by helping people to follow Jesus more closely. And in the process, you being discipled to help that you would follow Jesus more closely. That we see that that is all about the gospel. And it's understanding that even as the world starts to think a little bit about the gospel, the good news about how to be saved in Christ, sometimes it stops short there, even with Christians, because the gospel is not only how to start a relationship with Jesus, but it is how to continue a relationship with Jesus and how to be faithful until the end and how to be a witness to those who have yet to know him. Uh, as we look at that as a church family, we're looking at Paul a pastor elder teaching Timothy, the pastor elder, the pastor of the church at Ephesus, how to teach his people. And we're also looking at that for us as a model in terms of as we are looking for the pastor that God will call here to say, what kind of pastor is that that we are looking for? What's the profile? And part of that profile has to do with this topic we're talking about today. It's the whole, the whole book, but today also the finish line in terms of looking at, at our life with the Lord in terms of our, our uh, present, what we're occupying presently, our past, our track record with the Lord and with each other, and our future. Which way are we facing for the future. So that's what we're talking about. That's your, I should have given you a spoiler, spoiler alert uh, for outline uh, filler inners, but uh, you will get it. We're looking at calling a pastor um, who is ready to go, that their life is presently being poured into the gospel. That uh, We're looking at calling a pastor who is good at evaluating the past, starting with his own past. That means things sometimes we don't want to look at. Um, but who is, is good at doing that and seeing what's our track record and what needs to change for me and for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're looking at a pastor who is facing forward, who's looking forward to the coming of Christ. Now, for people who have been Christians for a long time, that's a, that's a little bit of a thing. It's like there is that guilt that comes in. Well, maybe I'm not looking forward to heaven as much as I, I should be because I, I, I want to see my kids graduate from high school, and I want to see my grandkids graduate from high school, and I want to see them get married, and I, wanna, I want to all of these things that are earthly things. But maybe we can, as we unpack it a little bit later, understand that to, to look forward in the sense of anticipation also calls for a physical, emotional, mental, spiritual posture of looking forward and saying, what's going to count when I get to heaven what will I be so glad that God used in my life here and used me for? And as we face forward, you know, I told you a couple of you know that I was, well, many know that I was in an almost head-on car accident. Uh, you and I are coming to a head-on collision with the end of our lives and with Christ calling us home. And so what's that going to look like? As we face forward, as we see everything in light of that, God will help us to be looking forward. I know it might not be so pretty when I say as a car accident, but at the same time, what does it mean to look forward? Because I can't just pump these feelings into place and say, oh, I, I get so excited about heaven when I have all these temporal things that I want to have happen first. But I can face forward and say, God, what do you have for me between now and heaven so that I will be more assured of hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. So with that in mind, let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give us your word to hide in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Help us to hear. Help us to uh, see where we're at with you. Help us to, to be reproved when there's an error that we see, errors and sin in our life. And uh, help us to even be able to handle rebukes. Help us to handle correction. Help us to understand that you put things in place for us to get closer to you. And when we are in heaven, we will look back and say, I want to be even closer to you. I would not even go back if I could choose to. So help us to do that with this in mind, with you in mind. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look here at um, 2 Timothy 4, starting at verse 6, and... uh, Daniel, you're welcome, that, by the way, that you've got a much shorter scripture reading than people have been getting lately. So, yes, you're welcome. So that means you've got to root for the Giants for at least one game. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> so we look in this context here, and we see that Paul has been talking about preaching the word, being ready in season and in out to, to give the gospel, to help people live for Christ. And so he's been saying that, and he told Timothy, you know, even if you're not, an evangelist, you don't have that gift, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And then he goes into verse 6 and says, Paul says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Well, you know, if we look at that in earthly terms, we say, well, that's not happy. You know, Paul is sitting two stories down in a hole in the Mamertine prison, and uh, the only life forms he probably sees are rats. And if somebody comes in to get him, it's not usually good news at this point in his, in his ministry. And he's looking at being executed. But he, he looks at it with a different slant than, than you and I do. And he looks at the end of life at a different slant than many Christians do. But, but just to backtrack, we've seen chapter 1 that God's man should be living every day. God's person should be living every day. Understanding that there's going to be the need for perseverance. Difficult times are sure to come. Ephesus, very famous in terms of uh, an outpost for God, and yet at the same time an outpost for God in the midst of great persecution of idolatry that was going on, and that, that town literally saw it as a, a fight that if, if, if the God of the, of, the, of the word prevailed, that their, their business of worshiping this goddess of Diana and making these little silver statues, that that would fail, and that would be directly tied to their financial well-being, and they didn't like it. So there was a fight going on on the outside, but there was also fights going on on the inside and, and of Ephesus, and, and people were saying, you know, that Timothy maybe was too young of a pastor, and they were comparing him to the Apostle Paul. Now, before you think Timothy's so young, he's probably 40, and he's 40 in a culture that probably didn't live as long as our culture lives. But he was still seen as a young man. So we see perseverance is, is needed. Chapter 2 lays out on some, some really great patterns for perseverance. Paul says, Christ, who is not only our, our example of how to persevere, even in, or especially in unjust times, but the power for us to persevere. And then Paul's not afraid to use himself as an example of perseverance. And he's saying, I, I put my money where my mouth is. You know, I'm not, I'm not perfect but I will, with God's help, persevere, and I know God will help me. So he gives this example, but he also gives a soldier, and he says in that example, he says, a soldier does not get involved with civilian affairs. For us, the example is a soldier's primary focus is on eternity and not on the temporal, not getting all so entangled in earthly temporal affairs that the love of God is crowded out by the actions of the world. He talks about an athlete. It looks like maybe a long-distance runner who, he says, stays the course. In other words, there's a course laid out. I I was never a cross-country guy. Uh, I was never a sprint guy. Actually, honestly, I was never a running guy. Okay. (laughs) You could probably tell that. Um, But but he's using this example of of cross-country where, you know, sometimes kind of lonely on that course. There's not people always there standing and cheering for you. I've been watching the Masters golf tournament, and it's like they've got grandstands set up at every tee and every hole. And there's people standing and cheering for these guys. If they scratch their nose, what does that mean? Okay, cross country, not so much. And so he says, I've stayed the course. I didn't try to take a shortcut. I didn't get tired and quit 
And that's the way we're supposed to be if we're going to persevere. He talks about the farmer whose work and fruit is not seen till the end, but his steadfastness, that word is, it comes out in the harvest. He talks about workmen who need not to be ashamed that they're rightly dividing the word of truth and they are, their life is like a piece of workmanship. He's talking about vessels as all Christians are people who have the Holy Spirit in them, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and that and that also we are, we are vessels of the, um, not only the Holy Spirit, but the gospel, this treasure in earthen jars. And then he talks about servants. And the word servant is diakonos, from which we get deacon or minister from. And so he's saying we're all put together to serve one another. And then chapter 3 spoke of the fact that there will be apostasy or false teaching, and not just from outside the church, but within the church. 1 John 2.19 talks about people that says they departed from us because they were never part of us in the first place. There's some people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And so there's going to be a need to stand up against these teachings and stand up to people who are false teachers. Chapter 3 then talks about the work of God's man and about how it is uh, involved with the centrality of knowing God's word. And we spent some time talking about exegesis. Remember exegesis, digging out what the word means in the context at which it was given, an exposition, giving out, exposing the word in the light of, of life in the church family. So we looked at a lot of these things. We looked at, saw scriptures, a roadmap of teaching us, reproving, correction, training in righteousness, giving us foundational doctrines, telling us where we are wrong, telling us how to get right, telling us how to be discipled and how to disciple being ready to do every good work that God has made us and saved us to do. And now in chapter 4, in this context, he's been talking about preaching. And so he continues that. If you remember from the last couple weeks, he says to Timothy, I charge you. Now he says, for I. And this is the urgency that Paul sees in his own life. And so he says, "Um, be ready. Preach and be ready. He says, I'm ready. I'm going to be leaving this earth before, before very long. If you turn with me to um, Romans 12, and probably some of you have this as a memory verse, and if you don't, I, I encourage you. But Romans 12, 1 and 2, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. What's the mercies of God? Not getting what you deserve. Okay, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. A lot of people want to know what the will of God is, but they rather than just have God tell them or show them or help them live it, they'd like to have input on it. They would like to have the final say on what the will of God is. That's like when a brain surgeon is operating on you and you say, hang on just a minute, I think I can do that better. Okay, we wouldn't do that, but our, our walk with God, our, our lives are so much more important than that, than, than uh, even brain surgery. Now, Paul is talking about being poured out as a drink offering, right? Five years before he wrote our passage today, he wrote to the church at Philippi, five years beforehand, and he said in uh, Philippians 2, verse 17, he said, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Wow. And then five years later, he says what we read, that for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. This earthly life comes with an expiration date. And God says to us to remember that what what we are doing is something that is very important. We're not just drifting. He's given us ability and intent as believers. And if you're here today and you have never trusted Christ, remember that you have sinned. I have sinned. We all have sinned. I was thinking this week because I'm going to see my grandsons. Well, it won't be for a couple more weeks, but they are moving into our house, uh, the, my grandsons. And, yeah, we're going to let their parents come too. Um, but <laughs> if you have to, you have to. But... I was thinking of how I would talk to them because they love these discussions. How would I talk to them about sin? And I thought if their mom would let me, I'd get an archery set. But at four and six years old, maybe not yet. But an archery set that would, you know, we'd shoot 
And when they didn't quite make it, because when you first shoot a bow, the first thing is that it goes short of the target. The word for sin in the Bible is hamartia, which means to fall short of the target. It's an archery term. Okay, and so the target is Jesus Christ. It's not that we attain, it's not that we become good enough to be saved, but the fact that we aren't shows us that we fall short of the target and therefore we need Jesus. And so if you're here and you haven't trusted Christ today, remember all the times that your arrow fell short of the target. Probably a few times today already, like all of us. The Bible says we still all sin. But we, we have salvation if we've trusted Christ. So if, you, if you're aware of your sin, then what are you counting on to save you? Being good enough from here on out. Well, how has that worked for you in the past? Not so much. Okay? And so even so, that would not unring the bell of sin. The Bible says God has pure eyes to be able to look upon sin in Habakkuk 1.13. And so if you admit that you've sinned and you believe that you don't know of any other way to save you. Would you believe Jesus when he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you do believe that, would you choose to say today, if you've not done it before, God, I believe help my unbelief. I have sinned. I need Jesus as Savior. Would you forgive my sins, take over my life, come in and be my Lord and Savior? Or words to that effect. If you would do that today, we would invite you then to take communion with us later. But, but more, on that, more on that later as we unpack this verse today. And it's talking about an offering for sin. In the Old Testament, they were not having these laws in order to show people how to be saved. They gave the law to show people they needed a Savior. And the one who was coming promised all the way back from Genesis 3.15. Right after the first sin of the garden, and now a word from our sponsor, the Savior. And so, in the meantime, the Old Testament pointed to that. The holy sacrificial system, offering system, was to cover over the stench of sins. You know how a 14-year-old boy, and if you're a 14-year-old boy in here, I apologize, but I was one once. 14-year-old boy, how you know they're changing in life because they have noticed the stench of their life. And it either results in three showers or a whole lot of cologne. <laughs> so much that it's hard to even ride in the car with those guys. I had two 14-year-old boys. I, I know what I'm talking about. And so the Old Testament system was, was that um, a temper to atone, to cover that stench temporarily, waiting for an anticipation uh, waiting for and anticipating the permanent offering of Christ. So an offering turned a stench into a pleasing aroma. When Paul is talking to them here, in this, uh, and he says, um, you know, I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is coming. The, 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 departure, the drink offering came after the meal offering. And he talks about before about sharing in the suffering with them and how great that was. So he's saying that the church at Ephesus, Timothy, that you guys, my work with you is you're like the meal offering. And, and how is, what happened? The meal offering would in this case be the suffering of the church. And after, in a meal offering, after burning the solids off, a fragrant drink would be poured onto that hot altar and intersperse and sizzle bringing a smoke and a more fragrant smell. Paul is saying his work is mixed with theirs and together provides pleasure to God as he goes out, having emptied his life into them in a service for God. That's what he's talking about. He knows that all salvation is only in Christ, but he's giving an example to them of where they live and how they understand that it's you and me. You know, I know I'm at the end. You guys have put in lots of suffering. Hey, we know Paul Put in lots of suffering too. That's where our illustration, you know, we don't want to take it too far because that's what Paul here is giving an illustration. But, but to say that the, the church and the pastor together mingle the offerings so that it smells good to God and doesn't stink to the world. And so he's saying he's poured his life out with them in service for God. And then he says his departure is coming very quickly. Departure is the word loosening. And, and you can use it in, for example, 
uh, unyoking a plow animal. The, the animal's had a first full day of plowing. Now it's done. You're going to give it a rest. You unyoke it. That's a departure or loosening, if you will. Or um, striking a tent by its ropes. It's time to go. We've stayed in this place long enough. I'm going somewhere else. The Bible talks about our bodies as tents sometimes. Uh, not T-E-N-S-E, but T-E-N-T-S. Okay, although they can be both. But he's talking about about taking it down, it's time to go. It's also talking about releasing a slave. A slave has fulfilled his purpose. Lots of times the slaves in the, in the New Testament are slaves of debt, so they're working off their debt. And so the, the debt has been paid, and so he's released to go. And it can even be departing or loosening a boat, like it's time to go on a trip. So he says, my departure is at hand. He's saying God is using him with all the people in the, in the local church that he has poured his life in to please God for the purpose of pointing people to God. So all Christians, we can evaluate our present. We can ask our, our future pastor to evaluate his present. What is he, what are we pouring our lives into? If I pull out my schedule on my, you know, handy dandy, one of the, one of the good things about a phone is that we can put our, look at our schedule and we can not only see where we're going, we can see where we've been. And how we've used the time that God has given us. So what am I pouring my life into right now? We want to find a pastor who is not just burnt out and, and tired. Not that there's not a place to, to help them. But we find a, want to find a pastor who is so pouring his life into the church that he's at. That he's not sure it's time to go yet. He knows it's a lot closer than it was. But we want to say we leave it for the Holy Spirit to call you to come. And we want a pastor to find a church that's pouring its life out as individuals and as a family for the kingdom of God. Because here's the thing. We're all pouring our life into something. What is it? And so we want that of a pastor, but we should also expect that of ourselves. We're not going to be perfect in it, but we're calling them to come together. Tell you what, Pastor, next, we'll be the meal offering, you be the drink offering. Let's make something that's pretty to God. And so that's what we're looking for. And then uh, number two is we want to call a pastor who is good at evaluating the past, even if we would rather not think about it. And so it's hard sometimes to look at the past. I don't know about you, but it's hard. If you ever listen to a recording of yourself or see video of yourself, imagine you were being recorded and videoed for 45 minutes every week. <laughs> it's very hard to look at. You've got to put your fingers up there and, and, and you block this view and cover. You don't have enough to cover both ears. It's, it's both. But we, we're looking at that and saying, wow, um, what's my past? Now, Paul talks about his past, and he is saying, regardless of my present here, here is my past. And Paul still has some time, so he's probably giving us a little list of his past as much for him as for us to say, okay, God, what more do you have me doing? I, I talk to older people every once in a while, um, hi, Jenny, um, who, who will say, why does God still have me here? The key is, You'll find the why when you get to heaven. But the point is, God has me here. And God does not have me here to drift. God has me here to intentionally be on the course that he has set for me. And so Paul evaluates it by five principles here. Uh, number one is, he says, I fought. He fought or completed. He's, he's had these things of sticking up for the word of God, pointing God's people in the right direction, pointing people who are not yet God's people to the Lord Jesus Christ, he has fought. Number two principle, it's a good fight. This is a worthy thing. This is not something that's going to burn up. Okay, this is something that's going to have lasting, eternal results that God's going to use for it. It is a noble thing to want to serve the Lord. It's also a smart thing because if you don't serve the Lord, you're serving yourself and you've got a really lousy boss. Okay. Um, number three, he is, like I said before, he stayed on the course 
till the finish. He hasn't wandered off yet. He said, you know, this elder thing, this pastor thing, this missionary thing, it's good and all, but I am really good at tent making. I'm really good at tent making. I could have, you know, I don't know, some catchy name of, of Paul's good camping equipment or Paul's good living equipment, you know. And if you want someplace great to live, you better call Paul. Some, something snazzy like that. And God used his tent making, but at the same time he says, you know, I have stayed the course with the bride of Christ to help love them to being the bride that God wants to see walk down that aisle. Uh, number four, he also evaluated by time. If you turn to um, Ephesians 5, at 15, he says, Look carefully, then, how you walk. And, and the Greek word there for walk is parapetuo. And I just say that as you're doing your own personal study, and there's so many good tools on the Bible, parapetuo, you know, I always think of the word perpetually. That's not necessary where it comes from. But as we're going about our daily life, even when the Bible talks about the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where it says go and make disciples, really what it says is as you are going. Make disciples. So perpetually. Look carefully how you live perpetually. Okay? Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most use of the time because the days are evil. It's like, you know, the old, the poet had said, we quote him here many times, it's only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And what I do is, if I look on my calendar, is this have eternal results? Oh, God can use anything. God can use anything. But if I was intentionally using my calendar, my day timer, my time, whatever that might be, to live for the Lord and plan things, what would be the best use of my time? And you have to remind yourself, Satan is right there at the side saying, oh yeah, but that won't be any fun. And God says, you know, there is no greater joy than following him. So the question is, when we write down something in our calendar, who are we going to believe? And so Paul does that. He, he looks at that timing thing. That's his fourth evaluation of his past. And his fifth evaluation is it says, if you look at that scripture again, it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, for those of you who are uh, grammar nerds, um, probably none of us, but the, um, this word, the faith, is both... Uh, subjunctive, subjective and genitive. In other words, it is the faith, the faith of following Christ. But it is also, I have kept faith. I have been faithful too in my individual life. It is the walk of following Jesus, but it's how I walked in the walk. And Paul is saying, I have walked the walk. And what's he talking about? How do they know about the walk? It's because of the word of God. The word of God. Paul has treasured and constantly given out scripture as the most important words that he can say to anybody. Now this is where it's, it's a challenge for me as a pastor because the, to be able to give the word of God is one of the great joys and privileges I have. But sometime in the middle of um, exegeting, pulling out the meaning and exposing, expositing it to, to the church family I love, I try to think of what are more ways that I can get it, and then I do, like, movie quotes. Have you ever heard me doing a movie quote before? <laughs> nah, okay. Or, or something in pop culture or something like that. And sometimes we can get so lost, I can get lost in the illustration that I may not nail home as well what I should in terms of what I'm actually illustrating. And so my prayer is that even when I give out a quote or a pop culture reference or whatever it is, that it would illustrate it in such a way that instead of remembering the stupid movie quote I give, that you remember the scripture and understand the scripture better. And this is what Paul did. As he understood the scripture, he gave examples, illustrations about how Christ persevered, how he persevered, how a soldier persevered, how a farmer perseveres, how an athlete perseveres, how vessels are, in a sense, perseverers, how servants are perseverers. He gave all those examples, but the idea was to say, we got to persevere. And so if you just remembered, 
athlete, farmer, vessel, servant, all of those things. That's nothing unless you remember to persevere. And Paul is really good at giving that out. And that's what he's saying when we're, when we're evaluating how we, our track record is. And we're evaluating the pastor who is to come, how good his track record is. Is how good is he making scripture memorable and understandable to the people that God has placed him alongside to serve with. And that's what we're looking at. And so it's a very sound principles. Work, you know, has he worked hard? Make sure that's the most noble of tests. Has he worked by God's standards of eternity? Has he not wandered off? Has he poured his time into, into that life and flooded it with scripture? And have we? Are we? Life is a fight, but it's not a fight against people. It's a fight with the devil for people. And are you presently engaged in the fight? And Paul says, spiritual fights from this verse that we're fighting to win some people to Christ and win our brothers and sisters to keep living for Christ. Have you completed the race? Don't wander off. Sometimes it's really hard and Satan will say, you know, you'll get relief if you wander off. No, you won't. It might be for a season, the pleasures of sin for a season, the Bible calls it. But don't, don't wander off. Stay on course with the devil. And are we giving sound doctrine? And then lastly, number three, we've talked about the present We've talked about the past. Now call a pastor who is looking forward to Christ's appearing. Okay? He says, and it, and it cracks me up that in the ESV, which is more contemporary language, and, and, um, and yet still keeps the, it's the closest translation to the original text, that the best English word we could come up with is henceforth. <laughs> Show of hands, how many people use the word henceforth ever? No. You know, use that word henceforth with your kids. By the time you get to the, they're out the door. Okay? But what he means is, in light of these things, in light of these things, and from now on, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but to all, also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, I will just say, I'm going to, spoiler alert, go to the end of that verse. His appearing could be his appearing when he came, that we love that look back. I'm so glad, Jesus, I thank you every day that you lived a perfect life and died a perfect death and rose and called me to yourself. But the, the context of this, his appearing, have loved, the, the um, tense is a little wonky for us to sometimes get, but that you have been living your life loving the fact that Jesus is coming back. That's the crown that's, that's laid up for you. And in the midst of that, like I said to you at the front of the message, a lot of Christians get guilted into that and they say, well, you know, if I'm going to be honest, I am looking forward more to, you know, well, the Mariners won yesterday. I'm looking forward to the Mariners playing the, no, the Mariners did not win yesterday. The Cubs, sorry, Cubs fans in the, be alert, be alert. The, um, but the Mariners are due to win today. So I'm looking forward to that game, Okay. Sorry. So, and, and people feel guilty about that. And it should be a litmus test to us that, that we love the, the gifts more than the gifter, the created more than the, than the creator, that we love the presence he gives us more than his presence with us. However, I want to not have you be stuck there because I think Satan would have all of us being stuck there. See, Looking forward to loving his appearing has to do with more than just generating affection for, oh boy, I can't wait. It'll be, yes, I'm going to convince myself it'll be way better than anything I've ever done. That is not the way God has wired us. So when looking forward, and I know that's not in the text, but it's in the context, if you will, looking forward also means to, I'm looking backwards. I'm looking to my right ear left. Now I'm looking forward. It means to face that Jesus is coming and to live life with the understanding and realization that he's coming back and even though I can't understand how and why it will be so great, even though he says so, it's coming. And so what I want, and he's coming, what I want to do is God say, help me to be ready 
I believe, help my unbelief. Help me to look back at at least, I might be guilty about what's in my Google calendar for the last few days, but today, April 14th, Lord, let me, with your help, be looking back and saying, hey, today was a good track in the track record. And let me be facing forward, knowing that I don't know when it's going to come. When I did get hit by that car, I, I, I can't, it all happened. I know they always say this all happened so fast, but it really did. And, and I went from, oh, that's not good, to bam, being stopped, head hitting, knees hitting, everything hitting, car sitting, all the, the whole nine yards. It happened so fast. Somewhere in there, as things are parsed out, I thought, well, God's calling me home. And, and it's like, okay, understand that for, it's, it's not, for, not, for all of us, it's not the same timing. You know, we have, we've, we've been praying for Harry Riddle. Carol and he just selected a, a facility for him to be in while he's in hospice. And we know that he feels like he's very close to going home. But you don't know how close you are to going home. Okay, drive on a Sunday afternoon on a sunny day on West Taps Highway East, you might be going home. <laughs> and not the home that you rent, but home in heaven. And so face forward. And God will help you as you focus on what is true, what is excellent, what is worthy, what is praiseworthy, as it says in Philippians. He will help you to anticipate with joy that homecoming. The way you, the way you were meant to, because you won't be fooled any longer. So God has stored up for Paul and for us an Olympic crown, if you will, of perfect righteousness. I want to read a little bit about that crown and about the understanding of the crown of righteousness. Uh, some notes that I have from uh, John MacArthur on Second Timothy 4. And he says, the Greek word for crown means surrounding, okay? And the crown was used of, you probably heard it was a laurel wreath, it was plated. We had a word the other day, if you ever do wordle, we had a word that said plate, P-L-A-I-T, and I thought, what is that? And I looked it up and it says braided. I thought, well, I had two boys and two grandsons, no wonder I don't know what braided means. Um, <laughs> But it was braided or plated wreaths and garlands placed on the head of important dignitaries, on victorious military people, and, of course, victorious athletes. Okay? The, the idea, the crown of righteousness can be that genitive or subjective thing. It can be the, um, what he says is it could be the crown of righteousness could be the source of the crown or could be the nature of the crown. Likely, it was the nature of the crown. Like the crown of life in James, the crown of boasting in 1 Thessalonians, the crown of imperishable, uh, the, or the imperishable wreath in 1 Corinthians, and the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5, in which life, rejoicing, imperishability, and glory describe the nature of the crown. So here it's that the, the, the crown represents our eternal righteousness that we'll get when we're in heaven. Further, to understand that believers, we get the, what's called the imputed righteousness of Christ when we become a Christian. We are seen through the lens of Christ, so we have his righteousness, but we're not yet what we will be. The Holy Spirit is working on us, like Philippians 1.6 says, he who begun a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. That is sanctification. He's further separating us for his life, a holy, separated life, if you will. And we have, the, the, throughout our life, the struggle with sin. But only when the struggle is complete will the Christian receive Christ's righteousness perfected in him, and that is called glorification. And that's that crown when we enter into heaven. And Paul says, I see that crown up there on God's shelf. It's been prepared for me, and the, and the implication is it's also prepared for you. And all Christians will be crowned with perfect righteousness, perfect nature of Christ, the sinless, uh, perfectly holy nature when we stand before Christ. So here's the thing, is face forward to align our hopes with that, because otherwise we're easily fooled into putting our hope in our 401k or our comfy house or our comfy car or the perfect relationships we have with some of the people who are our family and friends. You know, if we put our hope in Christ, if we face 
forward and say, God, what do you have in your plan? What's your agenda? Then, then each minute I can be more excited because I'm drawing closer to him. But our hope is either going to ultimately be built on the presence God gives us or his presence with us. And if we understand how great his presence with us is, then everything that happens we see as a part of his plan and trust him. But if we are trusting in the presence or gifts he gives us, eventually none of those things will satisfy because they were never meant to satisfy in the first place. And so the last passage I want to quote in today's message is this from, from um, Matthew 5. If you want to turn with me, yes, that is the Beatitudes. And as you know, in the Beatitudes... It has a lot of blessed, blessed is, blessed are. And the, the contextual way to read it, that the first readers would have understand the hearers of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, is happy is. Now, we, happy, we think, is a cheap version of joy, and that's okay. That's another message for another day, uh, maybe a study on the whole book of Philippians. But, but he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So contextually understand this, if we don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, we won't be satisfied. That's the truth. If we do hunger and thirst, we cultivate that water with the salt of God's word, the salt of his people, if you will. Then we will be more and more hungry for the things which do satisfy, which are in Christ. And it, and it says... Um, this is the opposite of self-righteousness of the Pharisees. It speaks of those who seek God's righteousness rather than to establish a righteousness of their own. What they seek will fill them, satisfy their hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God. You know, it's the basic thing of man is we like to say, would it be okay, God, if? And, and God says, do you really want to live eternity that way? Do you want to live the rest of your life with this okay? When you were in school, what was Okay. Oh, I know there's some of you guys, if you're, you're front row sitters, okay for you is probably, I, oh, it's okay if I get a 95. Woohoo. Okay. But, but for many people, okay is a 70, a C. Okay. Do we want okay or we want God to put on our paper, well done, good and faithful servant? And so that means cultivating a thirst facing forward for the Lord. That we would say, you know what, Lord, I kind of have a thirst for hunger and righteousness. Help it to increase. Paul's an example of pouring his life into God's people. He had a track record of treasuring God's people by giving them the treasured word. He cultivated a hunger for being right with God because he knew that that is ultimately where happiness lies. And as he looked at these things, and we would look for ourselves and look for a pastor, we want to look presently, what am I, how am I pouring my life into the Lord's bride, into the church? That's my present. In the past, it's good to evaluate the past. Not to dwell on it and get hurt or be puffed up, but at the same time to see where I need to go by evaluating by those things. Have I been fighting for God? Well, if I haven't, now is a good time. Has it been a good fight? Well, if it hasn't, why do I think it hasn't been a good fight? Maybe I could bring a brother or sister in Christ along with me on that. Did I stray? Well, if I strayed, Lord, help me through your word to get back on course. Has it, have my time been well used? If my time has not been well used, then Lord, help me to purpose from this point on for my time to be well used. And will I treasure the word of God? If people are going to remember what I said, not that it's important they remember I said it, but if they remember words, I pray that instead of remembering a stupid movie quote, that they remember the word of God and how to live it. And then lastly, to be excited about the Lord's return, to look forward to the Lord's return, may I look forward. That's what Paul was doing. That's what we want a pastor who is looking forward, looking ahead as how can life count from here on for God. And we want to be the kind of church that's looking forward in that way. So as we come today to communion, I've already described what it means to become a Christian. If you are a believer today, then we would ask you to partake with us. It says in Luke 22, 14 through 20, it says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And I've said this to you before, but I think, how great is that? Because you can't really lay down and eat. 
But standing up and eating is no fun, right? Sitting down depends upon the comfort of the chair. But if you've got kind of the in-between time, you're cozy and you're with your friends and everything, reclining at table gives a whole mood of celebration and trusting in, in, with the Lord. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. His last Passover, first communion. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And so he took the cup and the bread, and that's, that's what we're going to do here. It has the cup first. We're going to take the bread first. And what I want you to do is that Jesus said, Jesus is the bread of life. Whoever comes to him will not hunger. As you talk to God today, during this little bit of quiet time, we have 20, 30 seconds, talk to him about what you're hungry for. And, and if you've been cultivating the wrong hunger, then agree with him about that. And ask him to salt your hunger with his word and with his people. But just talk to him about that today. It says, God, what, is, what am I hungry for? What can I not wait? What is really burning on me to, oh, next is this. Well, if it's not something that will have eternal consequences, it's not planned for the purpose of that, then ask God, tell him, I believe, help my unbelief. Let's pray. We'll give you some silent time here. Lord, thank you for the time to be in your word. Now we ask that your word would be in us and help us to live in a way that pleases you, that is glorifying to you. Help us to realize we live that life together in the, in the body of Christ, in the local church, in your, in your bride, and help us to truly be all about getting ready to walk down that aisle uh, to be that, that spotless bride of Christ that Christ made us able to be. It's in his name we pray. Amen. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. You are sent.